Olá, começa agora o programa Boa Vontade Entrevista. Você está conferindo junto conosco, amigo telespectador, você também amiga telespectadora, as entrevistas que foram realizadas durante o 25º Congresso Internacional de História da Ciência e Tecnologia, que aconteceu pela primeira vez no Hemisfério Sul, tendo o Brasil como país sede. Esse evento ocorreu aqui no Rio de Janeiro, na UFRJ, a Universidade Federal do Rio de Janeiro. O evento reuniu pesquisadores, estudiosos do Brasil e do mundo que dialogaram sobre a história da ciência, tecnologia e também medicina. No programa de hoje, nessa edição, você vai conferir a primeira parte da conversa do Josué Bertolin, apresentador da Boa Vontade TV, com o senhor John Hadley Brook. Ele é professor da Universidade de Oxford e um dos principais pesquisadores em história da ciência e da religião. Vamos conferir. Professor John, thank you very much for accepting our invitation to speak with us a little bit to the Brazilian audience about your research in science and religion. Well, thank you. It's a great, great pleasure to be here. And I have to say, especially great pleasure to be in Rio, because I had never been to Brazil before, so therefore this is my first time here. And, and I am struck by what a great city it is and how very beautiful. Professor, talking now about the field of history of science and religion, you have a very important book that it's very much referenced by other researchers. It's called uh, Science and Religion, Some Historical Perspectives. And at this event, many other researchers are using it as a framework or maybe just discussing many topics about it, criticizing, but also using it as a model for uh, history of science and religion investigation. Tell us about this experience. What are you thinking of watching these presentations that are using your book or as a, a reference, a, a, a framework, but also bringing new light to what you, you, you shared at that moment? That's a very nice question because, of course, one thing I feel when I see references to my own work is a sense of, uh, of being flattered. It's a great privilege to know that a book that was published 25 years ago is still being used in a constructive way in an academic symposium like this. So I can't conceal the fact that it does actually bring me very great pleasure. Um, one thing that perhaps is significant in that context is that when this book was first published in 1991, I think that it did fill a need, a niche in the market, because there were very few books that used what we then knew about the history of science to present a different framework for working on the science and religion theme. And by that I mean that there were two very common narratives that one discovered all the time in the literature. One is the idea that science and religion are two human endeavors that can never be compatible, that they are in conflict because they have different methods, uh, that they sometimes assert propositions about the world which seem to contradict each other. And, and that conflict thesis has probably been the most prevalent thesis at a popular level from the late 19th century, um, particularly in the debates following Darwin's work on evolutionary theory. There are many episodes where you can identify conflict. So there is no way to reject conflict? There's no way to reject the fact that uh, in many contexts conflict situations have arisen. But the problem is reducing everything to conflict, right? Exactly so. If you try to impose that conflict model onto every historical episode. If you use that model, for example, to explain why perhaps an important scientific idea that was proposed but then got lost and then was discovered later, um, it's very tempting on the conflict model to say, ah, well, the reason this idea was never accepted, uh, the church got in the way. There's always a kind of explanation 
that comes out of that conflict model. And it's often the wrong explanation because historical situations are very complicated. There can be political reasons. The, 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 the Galileo trial is a famous example of this. It's very tempting to see this just as conflict between science and the Catholic Church. And Galileo was denied the freedom to propose the Copernican theory. There is an element of conflict there. But there are deep political issues as well. That trial took place during the Thirty Years' War. Um, pope Urban VIII, who was the pope at the time, uh, was under severe threat, particularly from fellow Catholic authorities in Spain. He was being accused of being too lenient with heretics. And, and one just has to see that these political aspects, in this case the Counter-Reformation, could have consequences for the way scientific work was judged. But to reduce it just to conflict misses most of the really interesting things. That's what I was going to comment because if we only stay at the perspective of conflict we miss a lot of for example the scientific revolution oh yes I, I, I think if you um, if you study the religious affiliation of some of the great scientific thinkers of the 17th century it's very striking how many of them um, certainly were thinking of their scientific work almost has a religious duty uh, to discover the craftsmanship, the wisdom, the power of God in creation. In particular, I think, um, the sense in which in the natural philosophy and the natural history of the scientific revolution, um, what, what the scientists are often looking for are generalities that we call laws of nature. They didn't often use that word, but they were looking for regularities in nature. And those regularities, they were firmly of the belief, testified to um, the fidelity of God, the faithfulness of God to the world that God had created. So you can depend on there being these rules, if you like, or laws of nature. So the notion of laws of nature, it's an inspiration from religious thinking. Can we affirm that? We can affirm that as long as we don't be too reductionist about that. Right. It, it's one important source of the concept of a law of nature. The word law is being used when we refer to nature as a metaphor, of course. But it's a metaphor that really implies a legislator. You can't have laws without some form of legislation. And so analogies with that legal uh, context, I think, are significant. And if you look at a scientist like Isaac Newton, for example, it's very clear that he understood his laws of motion and the law of gravitation to be expressions of God's power and omnipresence in nature. Newton has this very strong view that space is constituted by God's presence. So it's a very close link there between science and theology. Uh, before Newton, Robert Boyle, one of the great chemists of the 17th century. Um, Boyle has a similar, very intimate relationship in his understanding between science and religion because when he looks at nature through a microscope, for example, he sees these tiny, tiny creatures. And for him, it's, it's marvelous. It's, it's a great wonder that God could put life into this tiny, tiny might. So you even find in the 17th century new scientific instruments are used in ways that reveal something about 
the splendor of creation. And looking at all this dynamic interaction led you to bring up the complexity thesis. Can you yes, talk I, to us about this? Yeah, yes, I, I, I suppose I gradually became unhappy but both with the conflict thesis for some of the reasons we've just been exploring. But I was also unhappy with what is sometimes called the harmonization thesis, which is the view that when you understand science properly, and when you understand religion properly, um, they are perfectly compatible and in harmony. And that's a view which was certainly not as well known as the, the conflict thesis. But I was worried, I think, by the way in which some defenders of religious belief were overstating that compatibility or that harmony. Because as we said before, uh, there have been tensions and conflicts and problems sometimes within the mind of a scientist himself or in the mind of a religious person experiencing some kind of tension. Um, and I also felt that some of the examples that are used to illustrate harmony gloss over or ignore the problem that, that those texts or those responses are in themselves responses to the conflict thesis. And, and one example has always struck me about this, which is the, the Galileo case. Galileo argues that really one should keep science and religion in separate compartments. The Bible teaches us how to go to heaven, not how the heavens go. And that was very useful uh, in preserving the authority of Copernicus and the idea that the earth revolves around the sun. But it is very striking, I think, that um, Galileo's argument for the compatibility of science and religion in that way is itself a response to the fact that he knows there are cardinals and clerics in Rome who are looking at the Copernican system and they don't like what they see. So Galileo senses conflict and then argues for compatibility. So there's a kind of knowledge negotiation? There's that knowledge negotiation. And in that situation, you find another kind of complexity. Uh, I suppose an example here would be um, that if you accept the view that the Bible teaches us how to go to heaven, not how the heavens go, then one corollary of that is that science itself has not got anything particular to offer to theology because they're in two separate spheres. But Galileo did not believe that. And he argues in a famous letter, which was never quite published in 1615, but that's the date we're, we're talking about. Um, he actually argued that science was important for theology because it helped one to get to a deeper understanding of the Bible. So on the one hand, he's saying, keep them apart. On the other hand, he's saying, actually, you know, the science is important for the theology. And, and it's, it's complexity of that kind that I just gradually came to see is much more characteristic of negotiations over scientific and religious authority than these very simple notions of conflict and and harmony. And there are even some researchers, I remember John Polkinghorne, who argues that it was a conflict not with religion, but with some thinkers inside the religion of that time who were uh, 
more inclined to believe in the Aristotelian uh, form of studying the, the space and the planets. So yes. that makes it even more complicated. It does, and it, it illustrates a point that I stressed in the book that you kindly referred to. Um, I think what sometimes happens is that uh, certainly in the Western Christian churches, the Orthodox tradition, I think, is rather different in, in this respect. But new forms of science have sometimes been not opposed by the church. They've actually been accepted too readily. If new scientific knowledge seems to support a religious doctrine, then it's very tempting to say, look, we've actually got science on our side, as it were. Um, the danger of that, and it, it's another kind of complexity, the danger is that scientific theories and ideas change, and they change far more quickly than religious dogmas or the interpretations of religious dogmas. So what can happen is you can say, my theology is supported by this science, but in 20 years' time, that science may be out of date. And so you have supported your theology on a foundation which is shaky. Um, and that's dangerous for the churches. It's embarrassing. And actually, it, it, that problem was perceived long, long, long ago by St. Augustine. He writes about this in some of his own work. Well, you talked about the Western Church, mm -hmm. but is everything about a conflict and complexity? D did you encounter other forms of interaction? Well, I think one thing I should say about complexity, perhaps before answering that question, is that um, when we talk about the idea of conflict, we can identify a thesis. It, it's clear that... There's a conflict, accept, period. Yeah, <laughs> that, that's right. I don't particularly like the expression complexity thesis um, because I think complexity is it's a historical reality. It's not really a, a, a thesis. But I was made the author of the thesis, which is very flattering. I mean, it's nice to have a thesis named after you in a way. Um, but I see it more as a kind of principle of method. When you analyze a historical problem, when you look at a controversy that science and religion were, were involved in, it, it usually is not helpful just to start with the presupposition that there must have been conflict, or indeed that there must have been harmony. I think what, should, what one should do is to use the notion of complexity as a critique, as a criticism of oversimplified ways of doing history. Because even in a conflict uh, perception, there is complexity. Yes, I, I think exactly so, yes. So I, I did just want to make that clear that I am not myself um, so overjoyed by being the author of a complexity thesis. And, and for one other reason actually, which is that precisely because historical realities are complex, then anybody doing research on a historical topic can produce something and say, oh, well, this illustrates the complexity thesis. Um, but if everything could illustrate the complexity thesis, and anything you add to the parameters that you're using to analyze the historical situation, if any addition is adding yet more stuff, more substance to the complexity thesis, actually it makes it as a thesis trivial yes but uh, maybe it was historically necessary to shift the view of the topic and 
it has had its purpose. Yes, I, th I think I'm, I mean, I'm happy to say that is a fair judgment. Um, and in, indeed, it still does seem to me the case. No programa de hoje, nós acompanhamos a primeira parte da entrevista gravada pelo apresentador da Boa Vontade TV, Josué Bertolin, com o senhor John Hadley Brook, professor da Universidade de Oxford e um dos principais pesquisadores em história da ciência e da religião. No próximo programa, nós continuaremos conferindo essa conversa aqui na Boa Vontade TV, que foi gravada para toda a Super Rede Boa Vontade de Comunicação.